Hi everyone. The audio quality for this episode is pretty poor in certain parts due to technical issues on our end. We'll be upgrading our recording methods soon, so hopefully this won't be a problem for future episodes. Sorry for any inconvenience, and enjoy the show. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. If the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%, that impacts people's mental health. can't have a profit for the mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Welcome back to It's Not Just In Your Head, a podcast by two therapists talking about how economics and politics and other external world issues impact our emotional and inner and psychological lives. Uh, my name is Max and my co-conspirator here is Dr. Harriet Fraud. Yes, here yes. I am. <laughs> Uh, here she is. And I just want to give a quick plug, actually, for anyone that's familiar with the David Feldman show. Harriet had two outstanding guest appearances on the show over the last, uh, I think, two weeks. I, yeah. I listened to both of them and I just thought it was such a, an amazing, lively, informative discussion. And um, she touched on so many of the same issues that we've been talking about, but she kind of went deeper and, and uh, answered audience questions. And so look that up if you're interested in hearing more of Harriet's outstanding insights on all the same issues that we're talking about for this podcast. So some of you may already be aware, some may not, that May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which maybe at face value sounds really great. You know, uh, why not have more awareness about mental health? And on the other hand, you know, there are some things to be critical about for this, or at least to give a, a careful and nuanced critique. And that's what um, Harriet and I would like to do. So we're going to get into the origins of Mental Health Awareness Month, talk a bit about the nonprofit advocacy world's emphasis on pushing uh, self-help hashtag campaigns, which are, which is going relatively viral on Twitter. You can look up hashtags like Mental Health Awareness Month, Mental Health Awareness Week 2020, Mental Health Matters. There's all these hashtags that are trying to bring awareness to mental health I just as a, as a concept, and then mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, different forms of anxiety, OCD, PTSD, you know, uh, severe stuff like bipolar one and schizophrenia and all that. So again, it's it, it's tricky because we don't want to say this is bad. It's not a bad thing. We, you know, people should should be aware of the fact that human yes. beings suffer. But we're going to, as we typically have been doing in our still new podcast, we're going to zoom out of the personal and the in your head stuff. We're going to zoom out and look at the broader context in which all of this is happening. It certainly is about time since just shy of 50% of the country that is asked say that they are in a mental health crisis that is spurred by COVID-19. So they say it has had a major impact on their mental health and that we hope that Mental Health Month doesn't have as much impact on the politics and economics of our country as Black History Month has on the sensitivity to black folks in our country. We hope it's not just some throw out thing and people then move on ignoring an enormous problem. Mental Health Awareness Month, also referred to as Mental Health Month, has been observed in May in the United States since 1949. The month is observed with media, local events, and film screenings. The organization that uh, the Wikipedia article references is a nonprofit organization called Mental Health America. And you can go to their website and learn more about Mental Health Month. And their website says things such as the following. May is Mental Health Month 2020, Tools to Thrive. And they're talking about tools to thrive because they have these, these worksheets of tools like CBT, um, feelings identification, correcting your negative thinking, those kinds of things. So it says, since 1949, Mental Health America and our affiliates across the country have led the observance of May as Mental Health Month by reaching millions of people through media, local events, and screenings. We welcome other organizations to join us in spreading the word that mental health is something everyone should care about by using the May is Mental Health Month toolkit materials and conducting awareness activities. And I, I want to scrutinize that a bit. Conducting awareness activities. I don't know, like you wear a shirt that says like depression matters and you like walk around your neighborhood and point at it and tell your neighbors like, hey, you know, depression is a thing. And, uh, you know, your if your neighbors are getting evicted, you say like, hey, look, depression matters or, <laughs> you know, someone just, someone just lost their job because they were trying to organize and, the you know, the boss fired them and they're saying, hey, look, yeah, depression sucks. You know, look at my shirt. I'm I'm engaging in awareness activities. 
So then they have the statistic next that says, while one in five people will experience a mental illness during their lifetime, everyone faces challenges in life that can impact their mental health. But as you keep scrolling down away from all their CBT sheets and everything, there is a little sentence here that says, this campaign is supported by contributions from Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson and Otsuka America Pharmaceutical Inc. So nonprofit organizations have to be transparent about their finances. And so you can go online and find them. And so for Mental Health America, you can see from last year, they brought in about $5 million in revenue and their top nonprofit executive makes over $200,000 a year. And the other two executives, the top executives make between 100 and 150K. Now, we're not saying people shouldn't make 200K, 100K. The issue is everybody should make that kind of money. If every worker made that kind of money, we probably wouldn't see the symptoms of depression that we see, the number of suicide, of interpersonal violence. We'd see less severe bipolar and schizophrenia manifestations in the population. There'd probably be less spousal and child abuse. But of course, you're probably never going to see any emphasis from the mental health awareness advocacy world on things like strengthening unions promoting something like a Green New Deal or all the little subcomponents within the Green New Deal uh, resolution that have been proposed, universal basal, basic income, because these things typically are not considered mental health. So a comment also on this term, the nonprofit industrial complex. So it's it probably sounds like jargon to most people. It's not a hugely familiar term. But in a nutshell, what it refers to is that the nonprofit sector grew exponentially from about 40 to 50 years ago to now, moving from bringing in roughly a couple billion bucks in total revenue across the whole sector to now it brings in $1.1 trillion in revenue, which is mostly nonprofit hospitals and universities. But in a nutshell, what the nonprofit industrial complex is, um, a depoliticized and professionalized version of activism that shifted the emphasis in society from mass movements that we're attempting to transform society as a whole to these little tiny do-gooder capitalist mm -hmm. enterprises that we call nonprofits that find little niche markets for change making where they compete with each other for small amounts of state grants and grants from private foundations that almost always have strings attached. And so what nonprofits have done is they kind of played the role of quietly accepting what was happening during the late 70s and mid 80s, which was everything Harriet had spoken about in our last episode, the outsourcing of jobs, the mechanization and automation of jobs, the kind of 1% uh, tax rates being lowered from near the 70 to 90 percentile down to the 35 percentile, so that the public sector's capacity to take care of its own population was moved into the private sector. And then the private sector then took its now record profits, and donated little tiny portions of it into private foundations, which then uh, allocated little tiny pieces of uh, that surplus into the nonprofit sector. And the nonprofit sector then <clears throat> was doing what the public sector was already doing previous to that, which is trying to address environmental issues, housing issues, you know, hospitals, universities, all these uh, all these things that the state had been doing relatively well for some decades in taking care of through taxation, the nonprofit sector was now responsible for that. I would like to point out that the Mental Health Awareness Month started in 1949, as Max said. Well, 1949 was the ramping up of the House of Un-American Activities Committee, where anything social that you might want to do and any transformation you might want to make was considered a communist plot. Women's activities, even the women's strike for peace, was considered subversive, and they appeared before the House of Un-American Activities Committee, and so did all of the organizing that was trying to solve the problem en masse. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a pioneering feminist labor organizer, and also a one point the head of the Communist Party said, give a man a fish. That would be the nonprofit idea, give them a fish, and they will have one meal. Teach men to go fishing and women to go fishing for themselves. They will feed themselves. They will empower themselves. 
And so it was a transformation from a movement for empowering people to take care of themselves in their co-ops, in their political efforts, into charity. And that's exactly what happened with the women's liberation movement, which started out as an idea of empowering us and ended up with the infiltration by Gloria Steinem as a CIA agent and others to set up little organizations that are useful, that took care of battered women, some rape crisis centers, but not for the system that creates the ability to rape and get away with it, and not for the idea of homelessness and battery. And so we can see this not movement towards nonprofits, which are not bad, just like chatter, charities aren't bad, but it's a movement to stop the mass of people from empowering themselves and demanding that the state that takes their taxes and a greater share as the top gets a smaller share, but the state that tax, takes their taxes take care of them, have the kind of safety nets that they have elsewhere. And while I'm on a roll, there's just one more <laughs> thing I want to mention, which is Germany, also capitalist country, but one with a big safety net, one through struggle by the communist and socialist parties and the Green Party, has had 200,000 people unemployed who are getting 70 to 80 percent of their salary. The United States has close to 40 million not 200,000, 40 million people. And that's not accounted for in the difference in population. Mm. Why? Because the powerful unions that are political and social, as well as just economic, have outlawed outsourcing and forced every company that got any stimulus ever to put several organi um, labor organization members on its board, workers within that union, as well as people in the neighborhood who are looking out for the ecology of the neighborhood. And so what they've done is continue to pay workers and no company that lays off workers could ever get stimulus money. That's a difference. That's why they have a small portion of their population unemployed. And we have 40 million or inching up to 40 million people unemployed. Worker power versus occasional charity, that makes a big difference. End of speech. And and, and so Jane McAlevey, one of my favorite speakers and writers in the world, she's a, a labor organizer who has written a few books. One is uh, no, Sh no Shortcuts, uh, Organizing for Power in the in the, in the age of Trump, in the Gilded Age, or something like that. I'll, I'll have to look up the exact title. But Jane McAlevey, great labor organizer. She has talked about a kind of spectrum of change where at the, at the very beginning of it, the smallest kind of form of making change is direct service work, which is exactly what we do as therapists. You go directly to people who are in need and you provide a service such as psychotherapy or you know, some kind of healthcare or something. Next up is charity. Charity is, you know, you donate money to a cause or you know, you work for a charity, maybe doing direct service. The next up is advocacy, where maybe you could have a bunch of charities in a coalition, uh, try to change some policies on, like, say, the municipal or, or state level to maybe make some tweaks in the laws that, I don't know, give the charities uh, more ability to help more people, right? It doesn't, not a bad thing necessarily. But from there, she says, there's then mobilizing and organizing. And what she's talked about for the differenti differentiation is, Mobilizing is like what we saw from the Women's March in, I think, 2016 of a bunch of people wearing pussy hats. They're kind of like, uh, when you call it a march, it was really more like a parade, a sort of parade in the streets of people who kind of already agree with each other. And this is the most, I guess, outward way of flexing power, showing that, hey, we all agree that Trump is a bad man and we're wearing pussy hats and we're fighting back, although they're not really fighting back. They're just sort of showing that they agree with each other on stuff. And what she says is the most advanced form of change making is organizing. And the reason she makes that huge differentiation between mobilizing and organizing is that she says organizing is something that the um, that organized labor for the last you know century or so is they're like the experts in organizing. And the reason she points that out is when you are trying to form a union within any uh, capitalist enterprise, you're not just talking to the people who agree with you. 
you're using very methodological ways of talking to and persuading and engaging with people who uh, either don't care about the issue or they disagree with you about the issue. And she's saying that we need to really start thinking about how do we go directly to people who disagree with us and organize them, get them on board and create massive changes in ways that regular old electoral politics can't necessarily uh, solve in the way that at least we're doing it right now and the ways that the charity and the advocacy world can solve. So going back to the nonprofit industrial complex, the two parallel processes which were happening was with deregulation, outsourcing, and the rich getting way richer and the poor getting way poorer. That was happening at the same exact time that all of a sudden the rich were using all that money to pour into the nonprofit sector. Like if I, if you could see a visual, if I could like use my hands, I'd just show you that the, the curves on the screen go up together in that from the from around 1980 to now uh the rich got way richer that that line goes up and then nonprofit revenue went way up mm-hmm. and at that at in that exact moment union density was going way down and the amount of wealth that the you know the bottom 50% or whatever is going way down and at the same time, the nonprofit sector as a whole, as it was growing in the amount of money that it had to do charity and advocacy work, was completely silent and is still completely silent about the overall economic inequality problem that that put them into the position of power that they're in. And so that's the really weird dilemma. They actually accepted the money from the capitalist class that was stolen from the public in order to and it was really chump change in the big picture. It's, I mean, proportionally, it's not a lot of money, but then to, in order to, quote unquote, help uh, the poor or the needy, instead of actually giving power to the, the needy. So the nonprofit industrial complex has been criticized as a sort of um, tool of pacification of the working class. It depoliticized and professionalized social movements to the point where if you, like I do, work in a nonprofit, you can't really be too political because now it's part of your career, you know, you're a staff at a nonprofit and you um, mm-hmm. you can't get too uppity, you, you could get fired. Um, you're increasingly replaceable because there are more and more out there getting, um, you know, professional jobs, going into school, going into debt and then back. So they, they, they want to go into a nonprofit to do good. And so this is kind of the, the situation we're in. So bringing this back to the, the Mental Health America and Mental Health Awareness Month, the gravity of the mental health situation in the U.S. right now is so severe. The prevalence of major depression in teenagers has just about doubled in the last 10 years. Suicides are way up. Suicidal ideation in adults has increased significantly. The term anxiety epidemic has been used several times in all kinds of uh, parts of the literature. I'm just going to read one little uh, statistic on this. There's been an over 30% spike in anxiety just between the years of 2016 and 17. And then in the next year, there was a 40% increase from that. So there was a 35% increase and then a 40% increase from that. And the majority of Americans who say that their anxiety has increased say that it's linked to issues like health, safety, and finances. And if you think about that for your health, you're not just concerned about getting sick. You're probably concerned about the fact that you can't afford health care. You know, that you either don't have insurance or you're underinsured or your stress job, because if you lose your job, then you lose your health insurance. And finances, everybody is in more debt than they've ever, ever been in before. So the economic connections of this are, are pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Um, another thing to put into context, which is Harriet's going to go over for a minute, is the, the very well-documented links between mental health issues and unemployment. I certainly will. With every increase in unemployment, there's an increase in abuse of every sort. Now, particularly, there's an increase because people are trapped at home. There's an increase in child sexual abuse and child physical abuse. Actually, there's less overall reporting because it was teachers and counselors at schools and social workers at schools who usually reported the cigarette burns on a child's arm or they're peeing in their pants when they're way beyond the age for that. And then talking with the counselor, it turns out they're being sexually abused. There are more hosp- there are more emergency room visits for battery and less reports because people 
wait till they've severely injured their child. They bring their shaken baby who's lost its sight and maybe who's dead into the emergency room. But there's no one to report that an angry parent is shaking that child till its brain turns to jelly. So what we're talking about is that right now under the COVID strain, particularly the strain of being trapped at home, which is a strain on children because they're not used to having to learn from their impatient, overworked mothers or on a Zoom link that hardly ever works, and they're not used to being home all day with their fathers, I should point out child abuse is greatly reduced by age, when children are age six because they're out of the house at school all day. Now they're not, and they can't escape. And so that child abuse becomes much more severe than it was before. Plus, fathers who used to go and drink at the bar to let off steam with their buddies at the bar can't do that anymore. So they have to drink at home and get abusive at home. Fathers and other men who used to get off on sports and get their anger out by screaming and yelling at the television don't have that outlet either. And so without outlets and with male expression often being restricted to anger to cover fear and depression, there's a lot more violence in the home. There's also not only a spike in suicide and overdoses, because that's another avenue people look for to ease the pain, but also in mental health problems of every sort. And the problem, as Max so eloquently told us before, is not going to a nonprofit, because nonprofits have the same hierarchical top-down structure of charity. And by the way, when you give to a charity, you get a healthy tax (laughs) write-off, and the nonprofit will give a charity ball where you donate and then wear an outfit if you're a woman that costs more than you ever gave to the charity (laughs) so that it is an endorsement of a top-down structure rather than an empowerment structure. Mm -hmm. And we should say here that one of the ways out of some unemployment, because even careful societies like New Zealand or Finland have some unemployment, Sanna Marin, who is the prime minister of Finland, and Jacinda Ardern, the prime minister of New Zealand, has suggested a four-day work week so that more people could be employed because there would be another day where other people could start working. That's a nice reduction of unemployment. We should also point out that part of the mental health crisis here is people are abandoned Each state competes against the other one for protective equipment instead of having a central provident authority in the federal government equipping us. Our president is constantly lying and contradicting himself, and we have no protection from the top. And so people are frightened not only because they're poorer and they don't have the kind of support that other nations are giving their people. We're the only advanced nation that doesn't give between 70 and 80% of their salary when they're unemployed. We're not employing the millions we should employ as trackers and testers, no less as tutors for children and all sorts of other programs, mental health counselors that talk one-on-one on the, ra- on the um, telephone. But we also abandon people in their time of need. They have no sense of a strong, trustworthy presence to help them through. And that makes this so much harder. It makes it seem like you're home with a tyrannical, irrational parent requiring utter obedience, that you're abandoned. And other than other than Trump, just to name this too, the 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 modern capitalist workplace, where where workplace democracy, meaning like one worker, one vote, everybody gets a say on what work they do, where they do it, when they do it, all that kind of stuff. There there is no workplace democracy, meaning 
there's more of an authoritarian structure in the modern workplace than there than there is a democratic structure. So if your manager or their manager or the CEO or the shareholders make any number of decisions and you don't like it and you speak up, they can fire you because you've signed an at-will employment contract and there's no recourse for that unless you can prove, which is really, really hard to do, if you can prove that they did it based on something like discrimination, then maybe the labor board will help you out and they'll have to pay a fine or something like that. But that's that's actually really rare. And most people are so demoralized when they get fired that they don't care to look into all the sort of regulatory processes of, OK, how can I um, like usually what the labor board will tell you is that you have to have been documenting instances of uh, discrimination from the boss. You know, if you had some witnesses, you know, God forbid, if you had a union where you had a, you know, a collective of uh of coworkers who also had documented the same thing and you came forward as a group, you'd be a lot better off. But again, unions have been decimated over the last 40 to 50 years. So something I forgot to bring up in that the parallel process of the, the rise of the nonprofit sector and the uh, also the rise of extreme inequality in the U.S. is something called the um, wage productivity gap. It's the issue of over the last 40 to 50 years, wages have stagnated, meaning people have not really gotten raises. I mean, some people have gotten some raises, but when you compare for inflation, the cost of living, you know, like housing, debts, uh, all, all that, people's wages overall have not really gone up. But the level of productivity, meaning the productive output that they that they put in for their employer, has gone up somewhere around uh, 70%. So if you, just to wrap this around your head for a minute too, that every everybody is working way harder and if it's not harder in some cases it's it's that technological advances have made it so that we can be more productive like because of our computers and our laptops and and whatever we can get more productive value in monetary terms squeezed out of us more per hour than we could 40 to 50 years ago but we get paid the same amount of money for doing it this is another way in which the the rich were able to extract way more money out of us by making us work the same number of hours per day and per week like when harriet just brought up the four hour work day you know it seems great in theory like for a, a four day work week and like you said harriet it would free up an extra day and then the unemployed could maybe you know get an extra an extra day for themselves you know that does sound good in theory except the way that capitalism is structured in the u.s is that they still would have to be more productive than workers were 40 years ago and still get the same wage for it while still not having very good safety nets. So parallel process, productivity wage gap being uh, an enormous factor, rise of the nonprofit sector, wealth inequality getting worse, and then mental health crises getting worse. And the, the connection is really stark between unemployment and depression and suicides, for example. The literature shows that totally. there's a yeah, there's a two to three time increase of your chances of having severe clinical depression the longer you stay unemployed and a two to three time increase in, in the odds of actually committing suicide as well. So people's sense of purpose and meaning and dignity and just their material access to being able to have a basic quality of life is severely limited when they're unemployed. So again, why is it that the mental health awareness movement, if you can even call it that, for this one month of May that we can talk about through, I don't know, social media or, I don't know, maybe there's some news uh, news headlines on this or something mm -hmm. or some, you know, yeah, some nonprofit-led uh, events where yeah. we talk about mental health as a thing. I mean, to me, it's just a, it's actually a really bizarre concept. It almost seems backwards to me. But again, it's just if our conceptualization of mental health is just within the individual, of course, we're not talking about the the bigger picture. But why is it that the mental health world isn't advocating for uh, full employment, job guarantees, universal health care, universal housing? And also cooperative co-ops as a way of doing things. In right. Italy, the Marcora law, which people have tried to, people on the right wing have tried to repel unsuccessfully, I'm happy to say, is that if, if your business, if the business at which you're employed closes down, Workers there can get a lump sum of three years unemployment insurance if they turn that business into a co-op or make another business that's a cooperative. The city of Mondragon, which is the seventh, has the seventh biggest economy of Spain and a very successful economy, is all co-ops. And one of the reasons that co-ops can help you with mental health is that 
in a cooperative organization like the co-ops at Mondragon, if one co-op is hurt, you get a job in a different co-op because they're composed of many different co-ops from little ones like rabbit raising co-ops to great big ones like Frigor appliances. And people decide, okay, there is a recession. I was there during the recessions of 2008 when fewer appliances were needed or were being bought because people weren't buying second homes in that recession. And the factory that I visited that was making refrigerators and dishwashers, I talked to a woman on the production line who spoke English and she said, well, we all met. Our factory wasn't getting the income that it used to. And we decided as a group, what are we going to do? There wasn't mass threat of unemployment. The whole business didn't close down because then they'd all get jobs in other co-ops. And they decided together that they would work four days a week and produce less and get slightly less money. And she said, look, it wasn't the ideal thing, but I can stand by it. I said, well, how did you feel about that? She said, well, I'm not happy that I get less income, but I'm happy that I get income. And it was my decision. This is my company. This is not someone else's company. And these meetings of people to decide what to do about their co-op, even if there is no crisis, are mandatory for every worker in the co-op, which they should be. It's an obligation of a worker to take a role in his or her life. And, and you know, I asked several people, well, what about if someone has a nervous breakdown? And they looked at me like, huh? <laughs> we don't have that problem. And I said, well, what about if they're showing on the job that they're in trouble, that they seem to be addicted? And the people I talk to say, well, they take the person aside with their colleagues, a few colleagues, and say, we notice this. This has to stop. Do you need treatment? Because we, as your coworkers, need your full participation in this job to make this work. And he said that usually works. And if it doesn't, occasionally people are sent to rehab because they all get health insurance as, in addition to their health insurance in Spain. They get extra and, you know, walking through that city of 105,000 people, we didn't see any cops. And the whole feeling was different because people make a decision about what they want in their life, which really helps their mental health. It really does. And so why don't we have as part of our Mental Health Awareness Month, what kind of system would help us? What kind of economic system would help us be mentally healthy. But if it's all dependent on charity and gifts from corporations, we're not gonna have that kind of discussion, which is crucial for our mental health, as we can see now as our society is breaking down. Well, and, and our environment's breaking down too, right? So uh, yep. what are the mental health impacts if sea level rise actually makes millions of people homeless because if they lived on the coast, they lose their home? Right. Or if there are crop failures so severe over the next 10 to 20 years because heat waves are just killing all the all the crops that the price of food goes up to the point where poor people can't afford um, food. I mean, not that poor people can afford healthy. Can, yeah, they, they usually can only you know afford whatever's like at their liquor store or whatever. But like, you know, if in theory we actually had like a more equitable kind of um, equal access to organic healthy food, still the prices would rise extremely. So I, I want to just read a few points of the, the Green New Deal yeah. resolution because, again, in, in a really myopic and limited view of mental health, we wouldn't think that passing something like a Green New Deal has any impact on people's mental health. But I'm going to read a couple of these off and, and hope that listeners kind of make the connections between how these things probably would improve mental health uh, across the board. So the first point of the 10-year um, national mobilization resolution of the Green New Deal is guaranteeing a job with a family-sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations, and retirement security to all people of the United States. <laughs> okay, so, and I, you know, I'm sure there are so many debates on like, well, how do you do that? Well, you know, I mean, the New Deal did actually do basically all of that. So, you know, 
I, I think it could be done. The second point is providing all people of the United States with high quality health care, affordable, safe and adequate housing, economic security and access to clean water, clean air, healthy and affordable food and nature. Again, that's it's a pretty lofty goal. But Possibly. Would, would that uh, would that impact mental health positively? Of Absolutely. course it would. Most Absolutely. Americans don't have a guaranteed vacation. We are the only developed nation in the world that doesn't have a guaranteed paid vacation. And not having time off, not being able to relax with friends or family is devastating. Not looking forward to going away. You know, France is the country that I have spent more, most time in outside of the United States. They have a five week paid guaranteed vacation. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their employment. Okay, so another couple points, providing resources, training, and high quality education, including higher education, to all people in the United States. Would that maybe impact mental health in a positive way? Hey, if it secures uh, quality employment, absolutely. Uh, does receiving... You know, exactly. having the possibility to make your dream come true can certainly affect people, as we know. And then so this is the last one I'll read because there's 10 points. But um, but this one says, uh, meeting 100% of the power demand in the United States through clean, renewable, and zero emission energy sources. Now, this might not seem like it has a direct positive impact on mental health. But if you think about the... Uh, the proximity that the poor and usually black, indigenous, Latino folks in the U.S. usually live in proximity to fossil fuel plants, whether it's um, you know fracking sites or uh, right. e extraction sites like for um, for crude oil or um, or coal mining. I mean, not that there's a lot of coal mining left, but um, and I shouldn't. That's not just a race thing. I mean, we kind of forget about Appalachia and just the. Yes. Um, Trump talking about bringing back coal, the, the physical health effects, so you pollute the water or the air to a certain extent, and you know a woman gets pregnant and she's breathing in that air, she's drinking in that water, that's going to cause neurological problems for the baby, which is going to really impact development through the rest of its life, which is going to cause health problems and mental health issues throughout the family and the community. But again, you know, clean air, clean water, and an energy system that does not poison the air, poison the water destroy the ecosystem that we rely on, that's going to have uh, positive mental health impacts. The point of this podcast isn't for us to um, promote the Green New Deal. Passing something like a Green New Deal that, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez boldly introduced uh, a few years ago, this is something that would impact mental health in a positive way. We feel pretty confident. Of course it would. And of course it's achievable. Look at Jeffrey Bezos, the richest man in the world who's made 25 extra billion off the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, why isn't his wealth taxed? 25 billion extra over the 139 billion because from cheating on his wife and getting a divorce, he, had, he gave her, I think, 69 billion. These are numbers that you can hardly imagine. Why are they privately owned? In other countries, they have a maximum income as well as a minimum income. Why don't we? These are, you know, they say we can't afford it. Well, if we can afford, afford oil depletion allowances for people who own oil wells, and if we can afford tax write-offs so that people like Trump don't even pay taxes, mm -hmm. of course we can afford it. We could mm -hmm. afford it during the New Deal. We can afford it now. And during the New Deal... Wealth was taxed at 96.8%. And it could be done again. For the rest of the podcast, what we're going to do is we're going to read um, emails sent to us. We're not going to be able to read through all of them, but some of the first three that we got, we're going to see how much we can get done. And this first one says, Hi, Alas Derek Cannon here, listening to your podcast from Australia. Loving what you two are doing so far. As a political economist who has experienced mental health problems, your podcast speaks very precisely to both my experience and interests. I have always believed that mental health issues, for me, depression and anxiety, were inextricably connected to economic and social phenomena. In my experience, however, therapists have lacked the language to speak about this effectively. Often, as you would guess, the focus in treatment falls upon my own response to social phenomena rather than the phenomena itself, or 
they take the Thatcherite approach, <laughs> that's funny, and acknowledge that while the phenomena are problematic, there is no alternative to simply tolerating it. Harriet, what's your response to that? Well, thank you again, Alistair. But of course, we as therapists, we're trained to see everything as an internal issue and not as a social issue that impacts us personally and an issue that can be addressed not only by passively accepting injustice, but by doing something to change it. And we have not been taught about the rehabilitative and resuscitating um, (laughs) efforts that come from organizing and demanding care and consideration and empowerment. Those are things that are very good for mental health rather than passive acceptance of injustice, which is very, very bad for people. I've had a couple experiences when talking with a therapist where there's like either a blank stare or what feels like discomfort. And there's this concept we call like um, transference and countertransference. And so I've never been able to tell if I'm just projecting this, like if I'm insecure maybe or feel crazy for having the political beliefs that I do, that if I say to a therapist, blah, 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 uh, I was talking about this social issue and my friends didn't seem to care Wham, 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 I'm so sad. Why don't my friends care about stuff I care about? And like they might sit there in silence. And I sat there thinking like, well, oh, well, you don't care about this either. <laughs> and then I just feel like really, um, really alone. I've had other therapists really skillfully guide that toward like, oh, well, you know, what's um, what, what would be a really effective way for you to just kind of hook them in on what this this thing is you're really passionate about? And I go, oh, great. You know, and we can dialogue on that. But I do think I myself has, have made other therapists uncomfortable in sharing my, I guess, arguably socialist views, where I think a lot of them are probably still kind of suffering from, I wish we could have this in the DSM, we could call it like the McCarthyist uh, uh, disorder or something, right? Uh, We call it a a mental disorder where any like terms like um, workplace democracy or uh, worker co-op or government or union organizing like uh, these words are like trigger words. Yeah. Like I would say that that's should, maybe that should be a mental disorder, you know, because like, come on, like, why can't we talk about that? <laughs> political passivity should be a mental disorder because there, mental health requires connection and connection to the world and the society you live in and empowerment within it. And that one isn't usually included. I really hope that somebody at Fox News gets a clip of you saying that political passivity should be a mental disorder and that they attack us on Fox News. That would be the greatest attention we could ever get for this podcast. And um, I, Rick Wolf has been on Fox News occasionally. Mm-hmm. And um, the audience has people of color. And he went up to them la- later and said, you know, why are you here in this audience? He said, because they recruit the door people and the security guards because nobody else comes. And they want us to be here because one of them came up and said, wow, that's a great talk. Very strange to have here. And he said, yeah, well, why did you come? And then as he asked around, so glad to see you, you know, people who didn't look like they were too corporate. They all said, well, you know, no one else comes to here. We get recruited. Yeah. Because people want this message. They want a a message that we need each other and that we need to empower each other. And one of the things that we can realize now as they push people to their death in crowded workplaces Mm -hmm. and Trump's economic advisor, I think his name is Hassert says, these are our capital stock. They need us there (laughs) on money. We're our life, we're livestock to them. And they think push them into infected jobs. So what if 10 million die? There's 40 million unemployed. We'll get more and we can give them less because And that is a mental sociopathic problem. And there ought to be a definition in the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, that talks about sociopathic lack of social regard, which is what that is. Well, but then you couldn't, you know, sort of like Mental Health America, like could you get contributions from like individualizing, pathologizing and medicalizing approaches to treating it, right? Like to, no, like, you cause I, I, right. And I, th- cause I think like part of that is, um, and we, you know, we're really going to have to get somebody on the podcast soon, somebody from, um, like a liberation psychology, uh, department or something. It's a really great kind of fringy subfield of psychology that's based off of, um, Paolo, uh, free 
think is how you yeah. pronounce his name, the the liberation theology stuff. But it's the idea is like there's a there's a sort of massive um, there's a massive amount of suffering that you can characterize with, through, as depression, anxiety, PTSD, blah 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 within specifically oppressed populations. And so the treatment is really when that oppressed population fights back, rises up, and empowers itself. That's actually the treatment of the of the mental health. Um, it, it decreases the severity of the symptoms, whatever. I think that's the general idea of it. Be, it'd be great yeah. to have someone else it certainly that's more is. of an expert on this. But that would be, um, I've seen some chatter online from liberation psychology people talk about how, you know, they're, they are, they're trying to influence the APA to push for liberation psychology interventions because one big critique of liberation psychology has been that it's, it's strictly theoretical and they don't have... Um, there's no interventions you can do because again, this is the, the conundrum. If you have an individual client who comes in and says, you know, um, Hey, how do we overthrow capitalism? You're supposed to say, well, yeah. um, well, where, well, where's that coming from? Where, how do you feel about that? Where are those thoughts and, coming and from? Not these groups that might help you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're like, Oh, well, have you talked to the, um, DSA you know, the in your area? DSA. Actually the last paragraph of, uh, Alistair's, uh, email is really, it's actually kind of about that. I think there's a great intersection between the economic and the psychological when it comes to human capital acquisition, namely in the constantly escalating demand for education in modern economies. Korean philosopher, and I'm probably not saying this right, Bayung Chul Han describes this problem neatly in his book, The Burnout Society, link below, and I can send a PDF if you like. He theorizes depression as a response to the self-exploitation demanded by modern society in the labor market and its complementary institutions, such as the education sector. I would like to hear you to speak about the relationship between the demand for human capital acquisition and mental health outcomes, particularly in a clinical setting. I know that many of my friends at university experienced difficulties with mental health beyond the stresses of study itself. Many of them felt expected to be there and because they felt unsure of what they should do, but nonetheless had to choose a course of study anyway. And although I have to go in five minutes, you know, that's like a whole podcast episode of, of exploring. It is. And I would like to say that the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, as Joel Covell wrote up a long time ago, was sponsored and is every year sponsored by the drug companies because, mm -hmm. and they are not going to suggest social activism and lack of passivity and engagement as a way out. They will rather suggest a pill that corresponds to the Diagnostic Statistical Manual's diagnosis of you you know and the, th the thing is here I, I think the main issue within any sort of professionalized uh, whether you're in a nonprofit or you're in any kind of professionalized setting especially because we've all become uh more and more replaceable is that taking any sort of anti-capitalist position or anything that seems like it's an anti-capitalist position um politicizes things in a way that runs it's it's such a threat to um, any place of employment, any professional association, because of the extreme dependency we, ha we have on the capitalist system that, you know, somebody's manager somewhere just like can't wait to find something, so some reason to fire you for talking like this. And like, I'm not exaggerating. We're, we're, we're talking right now about trying to get a couple um, workers who tried to unionize their workplace and sub subsequently were fired because we want to we want to talk to them about the mental health, con the conditions that were impacting their mental health that led them to want to organize, followed by being fired for organizing, just to kind of help, especially other Americans understand, like, this is actually what we're up against. That if, you, if you try to rally a group of coworkers um, to fight for your rights, you very often will be fired, um, no matter how nice your boss is. Like, it doesn't really matter how nice they are, right? Like, they're open-minded, they're, they're woke, right? Like, it doesn't matter if their skin color, their sexual orientation is because capitalism is still kind of the, the elephant in the room we can't talk about. We can talk about social justice issues in, say, the identity politics realm now. Like, that's pretty common. In fact, it's expected. Yes. No, I don't want people to get started, to get discouraged. In the last couple of months, True. we had yeah. union organizing and wildcat strikes than we had in the previous 10 years, because people are saying, they can't do this without me. That's why they're forcing me into this situation. And right, I... Right will join others and go on strike. That's a great point. I mean, there are so many successes within the labor movement. So yeah, there are risks. It's scary. Um, you know, Definitely we're seen as replaceable careful. and everything. Be careful, you know, don't talk you know, Don't talk about organizing in front of your boss. Don't okay. don't talk about organizing on your work email or your, your work phone. You know what I mean? You know, meet, uh, you know, have the meetings on 
secure Zoom Zoom calls and stuff, or you know, when we go back to meeting in person, go like at least fifteen blocks away from your your place of work. Yes. But um, but but the the issue that Alistair brings brings up here in the the mental health outcomes of um, depression as a response to the self exploitation demanded by modern society, et cetera, and then and then with the education sector, that's something for us to maybe explore more because I can't yes, wrap my head around that right now, but. We will in a in our in subsequent podcasts. And again, mm -hmm. we both want to encourage you to communicate with us, to reach out to us, because then we know what you want and need, and we know what you liked and what you didn't. So right. thank you, Alistair, and we welcome others. Yeah, and we had a couple other emails here, but we'll just get to those next time. So if anyone wants to email us, um, just go to uh, it's not just in your head at gmail.com. It's just the name of the podcast at gmail.com. And we'll, um, we'll respond to you pretty quickly. Yes. And um, on Anchor, uh, which is where our podcast is located most centrally, there's this cool feature that no one's used yet, where if you click message, you can leave a voice message. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that would be amazing to actually have people's voice, uh, the use of their voice leaving the message, and then we could respond to that live. I think that'd be cool. That would be great. And we should sign off now. But yeah. we very much appreciate your checking in with us. And we want to communicate with you and hope you do the same for us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.